Right, so all set up, so let's get going. Um, reminder that Monday is our test three. This is the last slide uh, that's gonna be on test three. So everything that we talk about today and moving forward um, is all gonna be new information on the final exam and the final is cumulative as well. So it's gonna have some new information and then everything we talked about in this course so far. Um, but yeah, where we left off on Monday is that we were talking about, well, the big, the big idea we've been talking about in the last like week, week and a half is the membrane. And so on Monday, we started to go into the proteins that are in the, in the membrane. And specifically, we were looking at how do channels work? How do, how do we move ions across the membrane, right? And first we started looking at our multiporin as an example. And then we looked at the potassium channel and we ended on the neuron cell where we could see the potassium channel in addition to a sodium channel in action and seeing inside the body, how are these used? Where we have, um, just, just as a reminder for the neuron cell, what happens is that when a signal comes in, a sodium channel opens up, that's right there, and sodium flows in. When that happens, the inside becomes positively charged and that opens up a potassium channel and potassium flows out. And this just starts a chain reaction throughout the neuron cell where you have sodium potassium channels opening up in sequence to propagate that signal all the way down to neuron, the axon, and then you can send your signal to the next neuron. And so that's uh, an example, a practical example of how these channels work inside the body. And we're gonna continue our discussion of channels uh, basically for the first hour today. And we're gonna look at structurally, how does this potassium channel in neurons open and close in response to a difference in charge of the cell, right? So what we're looking at here is the potassium channel in the neuron that we just mentioned. What it actually looks like is shown in the bottom right here. You can see it's a bunch of alpha helixes and they're kind of shaped in like a cone, right? And our potassium flows right down the center. And there's two different conformations. The O stands for open, the C stands for closed, All right? On the left here, we're showing the same image or the same protein rather, um, but it's just represented differently. So you can see that it's made out of six separate alpha helixes. Now, the, the potassium channel is not laid out like in the picture on the left where it's just not like channel chan or alpha helix, alpha helix, alpha helix, alpha helix, alpha helix, alpha helix. Remember it's in this cone shape, but I think this representation on the left um, really helps to, to demonstrate what's going on here. All right, so the important things to know for the potassium channel to, to understand how it can open and close in relation to charge is this helix four. Uh, helix four has four conserved arginines and arginines is positively charged, right? And normally, the inside of the neuron is negatively charged. And when it's negatively charged, these arginines are going to be towards the cytoplasmic end. 
which will cause this, this to be in the closed conformation. And the P here stands for poor. It will be in the closed conformation and no, no potassiums can come in. However, when we have that, actually, let me get blue. When we have our signal, and potassiums flow in, then the inside of the cell becomes positively charged. When the inside of the cell becomes positively charged, these arginines in helix four don't want to interact with that because positive charges repel each other. So it's gonna, this helix is gonna move towards the outside of the cell. So it's gonna shift towards the outside. And we can see that, and let me erase some of that. We can see this in the bottom uh, right picture. Helix four, there we go. Helix four are these red ones, helix four to five. And when you compare the open to the closed, in the closed conformation, they're pointing down towards the cytoplasm. In the open conformation, they point up towards the outside of the cell. And when they point up like that, that forces the pore to open. And now potassiums will flow out of the cell because there's a higher concentration inside the cell than outside, so they'll start to flow out. That's how this channel can open and close um, in relation to, to charge. And then eventually, once all the potassiums flow out, the inside becomes negative again. Helix four, move towards the cytoplasm and this pore closes. So that's how the uh, potassium voltage gauges channel works. Now, before I uh, continue on, is there any questions about what I just explained there? Did I lose anyone? Someone not quite sure about the logic? Uh, any questions at all? All right, so one other part about the potassium channel that is interesting is called this inactivation ball. All right, let me erase this. All right, so when we measure the speed of this potassium channel, it closes much faster than you would expect if you're only expecting helix four to control opening and closing. And that's because on the end terminus of these uh, potassium voltage channels, you have a region of hydrophobic amino acids That's we, that we call the inactivation ball. Now, when the pore is open in the open conformation, it also has hydrophobic amino acids that are pointing near the cytoplasm end. And what happens is that this inactivation ball will swing in and interact with the pore and effectively close it much faster than by voltage alone than by um, helix four could. So this is kind of like a safeguard to prevent too much potassium from flowing outside of the cell. And it just makes sure that this pore closes incredibly fast. So that's what the inactivation ball is doing in this protein. And that's kind of what I have um, on this slide as well, just talking about the inactivation ball. 
Um, it's just laid out in words for you. And although we're looking at just the potassium channel in this example, um, keep in mind we're doing this because it's well studied and serves as an example to um, understand other channels, right? So if you come across a sodium, if you come across a calcium channel, you'll have a much better uh, understanding of how it works now that the potassium channel has been explained to you. So that's, that's the idea here. We're not so much focused on just one channel. We're trying to learn about channels in general. And we do that by looking at a case study, a specific example. Now, the next channel we're going to look at um, is like one of the best studied channels there are, and they're prevalent in our cells. And these are the aquaporins. And the aquaporin is the channel that allows movement of water uh, through our membrane. Now, remember, water is polar. Uh, the inside of the membrane is nonpolar. So water doesn't really naturally diffuse um, through the cell membrane, right? So we need a channel to help with that diffusion. And that is our aquaporin. And we're gonna look at AQP1, aquaporin number one. There are many other aquaporins out there, uh, but they all kind of look the same and they all kind of uh, work the same. So hopefully at, at this point in the course, since we're talking about a membrane protein, seeing all these alpha helixes shouldn't be that much of a surprise, right? To go through the membrane, you're either going to be made of alpha helixes or beta sheets. So the aquaporin is made out of um, a bunch of transmembrane uh, alpha helixes. And it kind of has this hourglass shape, which is being shown in this image, right? And it's kind of hard to see on the actual protein, but this hourglass is kind of talking about the channel itself. And inside this pore, as I have listed here on the text, you have a bunch of hydrophobic groups, um, which may seem counterintuitive because if you want this pore to transport water, why would you surround the the pore with a bunch of hydrophobic groups, right? Don't you want water to interact with the pore? Well, the idea is that since, you know, water has a hydrophobic effect and doesn't want to interact with, the, uh, interact with hydrophobic amino acids, if you line the pore with hydrophobic groups, any water that's in the pore is going to want to escape and go through the pore. So this is a way to like speed up movement by just having these hydrophobic groups. Water doesn't want to interact with the hydrophobic groups and it moves through the pore faster. But you can't just have nothing but hydrophobic groups in the pore. If you did, water would not interact with it at all. So in addition to our periodic hydrophobic groups, we also have uh, charge amino acids to hydrogen bond. You have backbones of your amino acids that can also hydrogen bond with the water. And this is a way to um, make sure that water wants to interact with the pore to begin with and also move it down um, through the channel. Now there's one key residue in this pore, and that's asparagine 192. And asparagine is right there in the pore. It's also asparagine 76, I should say, both of those asparagines. And you can see in this image that these asparagines are blocking, let me erase that to make it easier for you to see. These asparagines are blocking one water molecule from all the other water molecules, right? It's kind of like sequestered off in its own little space between these asparagines. And this is very important 
because it prevents what's called proton hopping. And proton hopping is shown right here on the bottom. And if you remember in neutral water, in any water that you can find, you're gonna have a certain percentage of molecules that are H3O plus and certain molecules that are OH minus. And these H3O plus molecules, no single water molecule remains H3O plus for long because you have an oxygen. Oxygens don't wanna be positively charged. So what happens in water molecules as depicted here, is that these H3O plus molecules just pass off their hydrogen to another water molecule. They just find another sucker and say, here's this extra hydrogen. You have the hot potato now. I don't want it. Well, that new water is now H3O plus. And it doesn't want to be H3O plus. And so it will pass the hydrogen over. And it'll just, water just keeps doing that. And if you measure the speed of hydrogen moving through water, like if you could, if you could label like a hydrogen and just measure its diffusion rate, it diffuses much faster than you would ever predict, like by pure like movement alone. And that's because hydrogens travel through these pro through proton hopping. It's just passed from one molecule to another. Now, now that we know what proton hopping is, these central asparagines prevent that from happening, which is a good thing. Because if these asparagines weren't here, then you'd have a chain of water molecules in the channel. And what would happen is that proton hopping would naturally occur, right? So, if you had a higher concentration of protons inside the cell than outside, then these protons would just flow out from proton hopping. They would just get passed from one water molecule to another until the pH was the same on both sides of the cell. We don't want that to happen. Proton gradients are very important to the cells. So to prevent that from happening, this center water molecule is sequestered away from the other ones who these asparagines. The, the water molecules are now too far to proton hop. And so you don't have a net movement of protons to the aquaporin. You only have a net movement of water. So that's our aquaporin. That's what the amino acids are doing. And that's why it's structured in such a way why we have to have those asparagines to prevent our uh, proton hopping. So any questions about uh, the information presented here, any clarifications, um, anything at all? All right, so this question, we're not gonna take any time uh, to do in class, um, but this is one that you should definitely try to do um, before the final exam. Um, it's a question I love asking. How does the structure of a, a protein molecule relate to its function? Um, basically, I'm looking for you to explain why does the aquaporin look the way it does? Why does the aquaporin have the amino acids in the channel that it does? How does that relate to the job of aquaporin? So make sure um, when studying, and even though I don't have this question like after every single protein, um, you should really get into the habit of asking yourself, why are these amino acids present? What are these amino acids doing to help the function of the protein. So um, make sure you can, you can do that and you can answer questions like that. But for the sake of time, we're gonna move on right now. 
and talk about some more examples of transporters. And one transporter we're gonna talk about now is the glucose transport. Um, we're gonna look at GLUT1. There are other types of GLUTs, GLUT1, 2, 3, 4. These are all very important when it comes to glycolysis. They're important when it comes to keeping the cell fed with energy. And it's actually a very simple mechanism to transport glucose from one side of the cell to another. But this is a great example of how these transports work. And these four steps, these four simple steps are basically repeated in a ton of other proteins. This is how a lot of our transport proteins work. So, um, and this is different than what we just looked at for the, the pores. So the pores, right, you just have a wide open channel. And the transport system, it's a little bit different where your channel isn't just always wide open. But let's take a look at this. We're gonna start in the top left and then move ourselves around in a circle. But do notice every image has double arrows. So this process can work in either direction. So first things first, we need our glucose to bind on the outside of the cell. And so that's step one, glucose binds to the channel or rather the transport. Once the glucose binds, we have a conformational change. And what that means is that the amino acids inside the protein, they change their orientation. They change their shape. It's, it's the same idea that we look in the R to T for hemoglobin, where when you have that R to T transition or T to R, you have all your amino acids kind of like changing position uh, to convey a message in hemoglobin. You can think of this as having an R to T state as well if you want, because there's two different conformations. But here, once the glucose binds, we have that conformational change. And instead of being open to the outside of the cell, our pore is now open to the inside of the cell. So the pore just switches what direction it's open. And when it's open to the inside of the cell, now that glucose is free to leave. So glucose dissociates we have successfully delivered a glucose molecule to the inside of the cell. And then we just have to reopen to the outside of the cell and continue on to bring in glucoses. So this, this mechanism of having only one face open at a time, this ensures that nothing accidentally slips through that transporter. The cell wants to make sure that concentration of ions of all molecules are tightly regulated inside the cell. And so through glucose transporter, the way it's laid out, we're making sure only one molecule of glucose transports at a time. And since we're not open to both sides at the same time, nothing like a sodium, potassium, or water molecule can go through that transporter. So that's the logic of this system, and it works through a conformational change. So that's our glucose transporter. That's like the simplest type of mechanism for this open and closed conformation. Or well, not open and closed, open to one side, open to the other side. Our next slide looks at the same idea, but it's more complicated now because it's active transport. The last transport system, glucose, was passive. If you notice, I'm just gonna go back here. I never mentioned ATP, right? We don't burn energy. And I guess that's a very good question I can ask. Since we don't use any energy, like through ATP, how, where do we get the energy to make this transition, right? Moving amino acids like this is not a free 
process. You need energy to move conformations of amino acids. So if we're not getting energy through ATP, where do we get the energy to make this change of our transporter from the open to the outside of the cell to the open and the inside of the cell? Those amino acids are moving. Where is that energy of movement coming from? And if you're not sure, it's the same idea as hemoglobin. Where did the energy to power the hemoglobin movement come from? What was the key thing that caused the R to T transition in hemoglobin? And use that same information you learned for hemoglobin and apply it to the glucose transporter. Where's the energy for movement coming from the glucose transporter? ideas, hypotheses, questions, if you're not sure what I'm asking. If I just confuse you with that sentence, let me know. Where is the energy? to change from open to the outside of the cell to open and the inside of the cell coming from. Any ideas? It just changes? No. Nope. It has to change. Something that, like I said, go back to hemoglobin. What caused that change? Like hemoglobin just doesn't change from R to T by itself. There's something that made that change, something key that caused that change. And look at the image. What is causing that change, right? Like charge attraction? What? Yeah, but what caused that charge attraction, right? What was the key catalyst, the key event that happened in hemoglobin? And on this image, what is happening directly before we make that transition? Like is a small fairy flying in there, tapping that enzyme and being like, you now change the energy I give you through my magic wand. Glucose binding, yes. So here, the way the energy that we're using to make this channel change conformation is coming from the glucose interacting with the channel. And that's why I was bringing up hemoglobin again. Remember, when we went from the T to the R conformation in hemoglobin, it was because oxygen came in and bound, causing that iron molecule to move towards the oxygen. So it's the binding of oxygen that that supplied the energy for that movement. Here is the binding of glucose to supply the energy of that transition. However, in this next channel we're gonna look at, we need ATP. The conformational change that we need in the sodium potassium transport, just the binding of the ion is not enough. Here we need ATP to make our transport happen. So we're going to look at active transport. Now this image is a little bit confusing. Maybe a lot of bit confusing. But keep in mind, throughout this whole talk of this image and this process, we are just talking about a protein and a membrane. The way that this image is drawn out, I think it's easy to get confused 
that you might be thinking that this enzyme is actually moving from the inside and the outside of the cell. And that's not the case. The protein we're gonna be talking about during this process, it's inside the membrane. It's an integral membrane protein. And this is just, and this diagram is laid out as a way to, um, I think to help you understand uh, what we're looking at, how it's changing. But we're gonna look at actor transport moving sodium and potassium. And the idea is if we're the cell, three sodium goes in, two potassium goes out. And this was actually the exact question we are the exact process we looked at when we did that delta G of movement of ions question on Monday, right? Where I had you calculate what's the delta G of moving three sodiums in, two potassiums out. We saw it was non-spontaneous and we needed ATP to do that. Well, this is the actual diagram now of that process. And we're gonna start in the top right here. This is gonna be our first step. And one other thing to know is that when we go through this, we're going to be seeing E1 and E2. E1 and E2 are the same protein, just two different conformations. Again, it's similar to R and T in uh, hemoglobin. In that same protein, different conformations. All right, so keep that in mind. So we start in the E1 conformation, and we already have ATP bound to our, our protein. So ATP is bound. And this is the outside. This is the inside of the cell. Whoops, got that reversed. Guess it doesn't matter, but inside, outside. All right. So what happens is that on the inside of the cell, we have three molecules of sodium binding to our protein. And we get this transition state called E1 ATP3 sodium. And once the sodiums bind, our ATP hydrolyzes to go to ADP plus PI. PI is inorganic phosphate. It's just a phosphate molecule that's been broken off of ATP. So we have ADP plus phosphate. The ADP is dissociated and instead a phosphate is bound to our protein. Now I'm gonna just take a quick pause here and say throughout your whole science careers, we you've heard about ATP probably since like the eighth grade. I'm guessing that's when you first talked about ATP. And all throughout that discussion, you've always been told ATP breaks down and you get energy. I'm here to break it to you that that's not how ATP like works. Like you just don't break ATP and then magic happens. Like you can use that energy to do something. What usually happens is that when you break that ATP, you usually stick that phosphate onto something. And you, that's where the energy is coming from, right? By taking the phosphate from ATP, putting it on a different protein, that movement of that phosphate is really what energy is, right? So if you just break ATP and that phosphate flies away, you've done nothing. If you break ATP, put that phosphate onto something, then you can do work, right? So that's what's being shown here. We broke the ATP, we stuck the phosphate onto E1, and we get this E1 phosphate compound with three sodiums. And once we have this compound, our sodiums are now free to go to the outside of the cell. And when they go to the outside of the cell, 
We are now in the E2 confirmation. which is shown in the bottom right. But we have now changed the confirmation we're in. We still have our phosphate bound, but we transported our three sodiums from inside the cell to outside the cell. So I guess I actually had my arrows backwards here, so I apologize for that. Three sodiums going out, two potassiums going in. So we transported three sodiums outside the cell. We changed the conformation of the protein. Now we're in E2. Once we're in E2, we can now have our two potassium spine that's on the outside of the cell. And when that happens, we lose that phosphate. So after potassium binds, the phosphate is hydrolyzed. And we're in E2 plus two potassium. And once that phosphate is gone, potassiums are free to flow out. So they flow out of the cell. ATP rebinds. And when that happens, we have our conformational change again. And we're back to the E1 phase. So I'm going to go over this again really quickly in case I, I lost you there. And I'm just going to go on the diagram on the bottom left now. So in the E1 confirmation, we have ATP bound. In that confirmation, we bind three sodiums. After we have three sodiums bound, we break our ATP and stick our phosphate onto E1. Once we have the E1 phosphate form, sodium now flows to the outside of the cell and E1 changes conformation to E2. So it's that conformational change that's pumping the sodiums out. Once in the E2 phosphate form, we can bind potassium. And once we have potassium bound, we remove that phosphate. And we're in the E2 with two potassiums. ATP comes in. The binding of ATP to our enzyme causes a conformational change. So we go back to the E1 form. And during that process, during that conformational change, the two potassiums are spit to the inside of the cell. And now we're back in the E1 form with ATP bound and we can restart again. So that is active transport. That's how ATP is actually used in a real sense. You stick phosphates on the things. And so that's the AT, uh, active transport for our sodium potassium bond. All right, I know that's probably confusing. Um, when you first like get into this, there's a lot of moving parts. Um, but just through that explanation, is there any questions or um, any specific point anyone would like me to go over again? Uh, did I lose you? If I lost you, where did I lose you? Um, anything at all? So you said the conformational change is what gets the molecule across. Is it that they provide energy or they carry them because they are attached? Um, it's similar to what's going on in the glucose transporter. And that's why we talk about it like first to show you kind of like what's going on. But it's like, if this was like sodium, all right, three sodiums come in and they bind. We have a conformational change and like the channel now opens to the other side and our three sodiums can come out. Uh, the only difference here 
between the glucose transporter and the sodium potassium transporter is that we need ATP to do this, this change in our conformation. But the basic idea is the same. We're just opening the channel to different sides, allowing the movement of these ions. And in these different, different conformations, E1 versus E2, only certain molecules can bind, right? In the E1 form, we can bind sodium. In the E2 form, we can bind potassium. And that's just due to the arrangement of amino acids. That makes sense how it works? Anything else? All right. So from our discussion here, what do you think is faster, a pump or a transporter? Why? So what I would like you to do is just send me a message. It can be a private message. You tell me, simply, what's faster, pump or transporter? I don't have a poll for this, so uh, just just send me a message, and you can send me a private message. Just tell me what's faster, pump or a transporter. We've looked at both cases now today. Well, actually, we looked at a pump on Monday, a transporter today. And once you have your answer, I want you to explain to yourself why. Logic out that answer. This is good training for you. Why did you say the thing that you said? In case you don't quite remember what a pump was, so if we just talk about transport, the pump would be like in the nerve cell. So uh, the sodium or potassium uh, channel is a pump. Uh, the transporter is what we just looked at. So the sodium potassium transporter. Let me see those answers. What, what are you thinking?
the pumps just aren't in the nerve cells. Um, they're, they're in all types of cells. Uh, we just looked at the, the nerve cell as an example. So I don't want to get anyone confused that pumps are only in the nerve cells. Another one for bone. So I'm going to do like 30 more seconds. So get your, get your answer in if you haven't yet. I think pump. So another one. Well, that's the 30 second time right there. Um, the actual answer is pump, right? Um, and somebody actually said a very good reason and put it very succinctly. The transporter seems like it'd be a lot more steps. Yeah, that's part of it. And also remember in the pump, once it's open, it's open. Ions are just gonna be flowing through. So like the pump has two conformations that we looked at in the neuron cell, right? So if we're looking at the potassium pump or potassium channel in the neuron, it had a close and open conformation. However, once you're open, you're open. You're open to both sides of the membrane. You're open to the inside and outside of the cell. So potassium, just flows through that. In the transporter, let's take a look at our transporter. You're only open to one side at a time. That's a better image of it. You're only ever open to one part of the cell. You're either open to the outside or the inside. You're never open to both like the pump is. So you are limited to moving one thing or one group of things at a time. So a transporter is incredibly slow when compared to the pump. The pump is just magnitude to order faster because it's open to both sides of the cell. So it would be the pump. Any questions about the difference between a pump or a transporter? All right, um, just seeing what we have. Okay, so I'm gonna skip the so uh, the calcium ATPase for time. Um, this is how calcium is moved from one side of the cell to another for like muscle contraction, neurotransmitters. It's the same idea as the um, sodium potassium channel we just looked at, um, but for just for time sakes, I'm going to skip this, this uh, channel, move on. So just mark that in your notes. We skipped over this, so I'm not going to ask you to be responsible for it on the test. Um, I'm going to skip this question as well for time six. So make sure you make a note of that, that I won't ask you to be responsible for question four. But what we will talk about are 
ABC transporters, because they're a big class of membrane proteins, and they're very important when it comes to uh, certain diseases. So what an ABC transport is, it's a class of molecules, right? And they pump a lot of different things. And the reason they're called ABC transporters is because they have the ability to bind ATP. So ABC stands for ATP binding cassette. I don't know how to spell cassette, sorry. Um, that means that they have domains on their proteins that bind ATP. That's what NBD1 and NBD2 means. It means nucleotide binding domain. Nucleotide binding domain. So these use ATP, sometimes actually GTP, to pump out things from the cell. And one annoying thing they do is cancer cells will pump out um, drugs, uh, anti-cancer drugs, because anti-cancer drugs, for the most part, are nonpolar, so they can go through the cell membrane. However, there is an ABC transporter called P-glycoprotein, which we're showing here. And what P-glycoprotein does is that it will bind to nonpolar molecules and pump them out of the cell. That's what's being shown here. This purple thing is like, you can think of that as a nonpolar uh, anti-cancer drug. And so it's trying to make its way through the cell membrane into the cell. However, peak glycoprotein will intercept that and just pump it right back out. And so some cancer cells will overexpress peak glycoprotein and then you can't kill them. It's really annoying. Um, humans, we know of 48 different ABC transporters, and there's one important one when it comes to uh, disease. And question five, what do all ABC transporters have in common? Again, this is a, or a good review question when going back, but they can all bind ATP. Uh, it's in the name, ATP binding cassette. They bind nucleotides. But one type of uh, ABC transporter that's important when it comes to disease is the cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductance regulator, or CFTR. CFTR is an ABC transporter that pumps uh, chlorine ions out of the cell. However, if you have a mutation in CFTR, you are unable to pump out chlorines. And what happens when you can't pump out chlorines as shown in these images, you get mucus buildup inside your lungs. And this mucus buildup causes bacterial infections, causes difficulty in breathing. Um, and you have a much lower life expectancy with cystic fibrosis because of this. And 70% of all cystic fibrosis is due to a single deletion of phenylalanine 508. So one amino acid change in the protein CFTR causes chlorines not to be pumped out anymore, causes this mucus buildup, causes infection, trouble breathing, um, and very lower life expectancy. So that's how cystic fibrosis is caused, just by one amino acid deletion in an ABC transporter in the lungs. Okay. Now we're gonna just finish off our talk about transporters here by looking at um, the glucose transport system. And we're gonna look at what's called secondary active transport. Now, let's focus on the image 
And then we're gonna talk about what I mean by secondary active transport. So here we're gonna actually start on image C. Inside your uh, small intestine, in your um, the cells that, that are right against the cell, uh, small intestine, you have what's called a symport, a sodium glucose symport. And what a symport is, transports two molecules in the same direction. So this is how we get we we take up so uh, sorry glucose after eating a meal is that we take glucose and sodium. The glucose moves through the cell and then it is transferred to the blood via a uniport. So a uniport transports one molecule However, since our glucose is leaving, we still imported this sodium. And if we didn't get rid of this sodium, then this import would break down because you would have too much sodium. And so why would this import actually bring in more sodium? It would actually work in reverse where it would start pumping out sodium and glucose, which is not good. You don't want to pump glucose back into the intestine. So we need to get rid of this sodium. And the way we do that is through the sodium potassium ATPase we just looked at, that diagram, where we pump sodium out of the cell and bring potassium into the cell. And this is an antiport. And an antiport transports two molecules in opposite directions. And as we talked about already, the sodium potassium ATPase, well, it's in the name, it requires ATP. And this is where our secondary active transport, that phrase comes in. Because we are really concerned about transporting glucose. However, at the point of contact, the point of moving up glucose, we don't actually burn ATP there. We burn ATP in a secondary reaction to get the sodium out of the cell. So that's why it's secondary active transport. We still need ATP for the transport of glucose. It just doesn't happen directly at the protein. It happens in a secondary step that is related to our first step. That's secondary active transport. And what we learned from this is that if you have um, severe salt and water loss, like if you have diarrhea, the way to get salt back into your system is you should give the person glucose as well, because you can see glucose and sodium travel together. So if you are very low in electrolytes, very, very low in salt, you should have some sugar in addition to salt, and it'll actually speed up your recovery. It'll speed up um, your body uptaking that salt. So that's just a little fun fact of how we can use biochemistry in a health-related way. Um, but any questions about our glucose transport here, what secondary active transport means, anything at all uh, so far. All right. Um, and I think I'm going to skip this lactose permease. 
It's it's a similar idea to the glucose transport system and the sodium potassium pump. It's just another example of the same concept. Um, but for um, time's sake, um, I'm not going to hold you responsible for lactose permeate. So again, make sure you make a note of that in your notes that we're going to skip this. And so um, don't, don't spend time uh, studying this slide because I'm not going to ask you questions on it. But with that, that ends our discussion on membranes. So we're finally going to leave membranes and membrane proteins behind now. And we're going to go on to, I believe, our last major topic of the semester. And that's enzymes, kinetics, and thermodynamics. So let me pop up that slide now. Do I have it open? I do. There it is. And if you download it from the internet, I accidentally put June 28th. Almost August, hard to believe. Or maybe not hard to believe, I guess. So we are gonna talk about enzymes. And enzymes are similar to catalysts that you talked about in organic chemistry. But there are four major ways that they differ from the catalyst you talked about in organic chemistry. One, they are much faster than anything that humans have developed. They speed up reactions by a million to, what is that? That's like 100 trillion. Is that 100 trillion? That might actually be higher than 100 trillion uh, times faster. And not only that, they work in very mild conditions. When you do like organic chemistry, you have to use like very high temperatures. You have to use like very acidic pHs. You have to use high pressures. You have to use solvents that are very toxic. Enzymes work at body temperature. They work at atmospheric pressure. Most of them work at a pH of like 7.3. So enzymes are work in very mild conditions compared to our organic chemistry catalysts. And enzymes also have a great reaction specificity. What I mean by that is that they don't do other reactions. They rarely have side products. Organic uh, chemistry, those catalysts, you're happy if you get like 80%, 90% of your product back. Um, those of you who have watched Breaking Bad, if you haven't yet, um, I highly recommend it. One, because you have taken organic chemistry, so you would enjoy it a lot more. And two, it's just a good show to begin with. But there, uh, Walter White, is like, he's considered a genius in making meth because his things are like 98% pure, which is unheard of for uh, the other people making meth. Well, enzymes in the body, they would be like 99.99% pure, right? And that's all, more or less all enzymes. They just don't do side reactions. They make the product they're supposed to make. And lastly, enzymes are highly regulated. There are a multitude of different ways to turn on, turn off an enzyme, speed up, slow down an enzyme. Um, so there are, the body just has a ton of ways to modify our enzymes. For organic chem uh, catalysts, once it's in there, it's in there. The only way you're turning that off is either the reaction's done, you don't have any more uh, substrates, or you destroy the catalyst somehow, or the catalyst is uh, just exhausted. So organic catalysts have like an on-off switch. 
enzymes a lot of times have a dimmer switch. You can, you can modify speeds. You can turn it off and on too, but you can also modify it a lot. So those are the four differences between our enzymes in our covalent kettles. Our, our, our not covalent catalysts, organic chemistry catalysts. And when it comes to enzymes, if you uh, find a protein and it ends in the word ACE, you can be pretty confident you're talking about an enzyme. So any protein that ends in ACE, ASE, that's probably an enzyme. And for the most part, people try to name enzymes based on what they're doing. For example, urease works on urea. Alcohol dehydrogenase removes a hydrogen from alcohol groups. Uh, that's not always the case. Um, like there's an enzyme called um, catalase, right? You would never guess what catalase does. Um, I think an enzyme is called, uh, yeah, there's an enzyme called Sonic the Hedgehog that's uh, really big in cancer now. So you could have cancer because you have a mutated Sonic the Hedgehog. And whoever discovered that decided to do more chuckles. The, the thing that inhibits Sonic the Hedgehog is called Robotnik. And if you don't know what that means, it's basically from a video game about a blue hedgehog whose enemy is Robotnik. So yeah, uh, scientists are super nerdy. But mainly nowadays, you're not allowed to do that. You have to name the enzyme after what it does. And generally, we have six classes of enzymes, as shown here. Um, there are also subclasses and sub-subclasses. And so enzymes get a systematic name and numbering system, as shown down here. Uh, EC4213, that would be enzyme commission class four. So this is a lyase. Subclass or subclass two, sub subclass one, and zero number three in that sub subclass. So, if you ever see an enzyme with like four, or you ever see a protein that's EC four numbers, that's just a way to systematically log those enzymes. And don't worry, I'm not going to ask you to like, I'm not going to say I have a protein and it's EC two. What type of enzyme is that? I'm not, I don't care that you would memorize these, you could always look that up. Just know that we do classify enzymes by their reaction types. And enzymes bind um, substrates specifically. And the way that they bind their substrate, the thing that they work on, um, there are two different models out there of binding. One's called the induced fit, one's called lock and key, right? And in the induced fit model, the idea there is that when the substrate binds, it binds weakly at first. So upon binding, it's a, it's a weak binding, but this binding causes a conformational change an enzyme, which leads to strong binding. So that's the induced fit model. That is when you make your first fit, you're inducing a change in, in the enzyme. The lock and key is just what it sounds like. The substrate fits perfectly into the enzyme, like a key fits perfectly into a lock. Um, we're gonna learn that the induced fit model is more correct, but we can still, as it's still important to understand how the lock and key model works because we can use that in our understanding of enzyme reactions. But those are the two different ways, um, two different models rather of enzymes binding to their substrates. Now, 
I did mention that enzymes don't do side reactions. They can though. Um, they don't do as much as our chemical catalysts, but they can. They are still prone to it. Um, so some enzymes can can do reactions on substrates that are that are similar to their original substrate. What I mean by that is that alcohol dehydrogenase that usually works on ethanol, and it takes ethanol and makes it acetaldehyde. However, alcohol dehydrogenase also works on methanol. Not as fast, I should say faster, not farther. But it takes methanol and make it the formaldehyde. That's why if you drink methanol, you go blind or it can kill you um, because it makes it into formaldehyde, which is toxic. It can also take isopropanol and make it to acetone. So here we have an enzyme that is can work on different substrates. Uh, we also have digestive enzymes doing the same thing here, chymotrypsin. What chymotrypsin does is that it breaks peptide bonds, but it can also break ester bonds. Not as fast, but it can. So some enzymes are permissive on what substrate they will accept. Not all enzymes, but some enzymes. So at this point, um, any questions about enzymes or anything else up to this point? Right. Now, when it comes to enzymes, sometimes you need other molecules for that enzyme to work. And those other molecules are generally called cofactors. And I hear I have, I have them being called chemical teeth. So in that example, your enzyme would be your jaw and that it moves up and down. However, if you don't have teeth, your jaw can move up and down all at once. You're not going to chew food. And so these cofactors are the teeth that are doing the actual work. And the enzyme is the jaw that the teeth will fit in. And there are different classifications. If you're a metal ion, you're just called a metal ion. If you're not a metal ion, if you're organic, you're called a coenzyme. And coenzymes have two further classifications. If you're always bound, you're called a prosthetic group. If you're transient, in one second. Sorry, I had to sneeze. If you're transient, that is, you bind and then you don't bind, you're called a co-substrate. Right, so prosthetic group always bound, co-substrate only bound some of the time. And these, like I said, these help with the reaction. And a prosthetic group, an example of that, as I have here, is heme in hemoglobin. So our heme is a cofactor. It's always bound, so it's a prosthetic group. Along with that, since if you have a cofactor, we have some terminology to go with that. If you're a hollow enzyme, that means you have your cofactor bound and you're a working enzyme. If you're an apoenzyme, that means your cofactor has been removed. So minus cofactor plus cofactor. If you ever read a paper about enzymes, ever go to a talk, ever see a poster about enzymes, you're going to see the terms hollow enzyme and apoenzyme. Um, and for some reason, that always confused me as a student to know which one is which. So hollow enzyme is the working enzyme. It has your cofactor. Apo is without the cofactor and it doesn't work. And to be a cofactor, 
you really have to be involved in the chemistry. So you're changed during the reaction. And since you're changed, that means you have to be regenerated after every cycle. Because if you remember from organic chemistry, what makes a catalyst a catalyst is that it's reused in reactions. If you are only, if you're used in one one reaction, then you can't be used again. You're not a catalyst. So a catalyst has to be reusable. Therefore, the cofactor must be regenerated to its original state. And along with enzymes, we have transition state diagrams to help us un understand the chemical reaction of an enzyme. So I'm gonna go back down to these charts and explain what these charts say. And we actually looked at these charts already back in like week two or week one or week two, um, but now we're gonna go to them in depth. So what these charts are is that on the y-axis, we have free energy. Remember, negative energy is favorable. Positive energy is unfavorable. And we have reaction coordinates. So what this means is that on the left, we're all reactants. On the right, we're all products. And this hill here is our transition state. This is the highest energy state of the reaction, the most unfavorable state. And this is when you are half product, half reactant. And the way that this is laid out is that we have a very simple reaction where we have a covalent bond between hydrogen A and B. And our reaction, it's going to be, we're gonna change that so we have a covalent bond between hydrogen B and C. So our reaction is simply moving a hydrogen bond or, or a covalent bond. Therefore, our transition state is halfway between these two states, if this is our reactant and our products. So our transition state is we have a partial covalent bond between A and B. And we have a partial covalent bond between B and C. Very high energy, unfavorable. We're not bound to actually anything. So that's where our transition is. In the energy, between the reactant and our transition state, it's called delta G double dagger. That's what that symbol is, it's a double dagger. And this is also called the free energy of activation. That is, how much energy do we have to put in for the reaction to, to, uh, to go? This is like our energy investment phase. This is also our rate determining step. The bigger delta G double dagger is, the slower our reaction is. And we can calculate that through this equation. The rate of our reaction equals exponent, negative delta G double dagger divided by RT, R is the gas constant, T is temperature. So the higher delta, delta G double dagger is, the lower our rate is. Now on B, we're looking at a similar graph. The only difference here is we're actually showing delta G reaction now. So the energy difference between the reactants and the products is called delta G reaction. So don't get those two mixed up. Delta G and delta G double dagger, two different things. So this is between reactants and products. And this is between reactants 
in transition state, which I'm just going to write TS. This is rate determining step. All right. So, any questions about anything this slide says, our reaction coordinate diagrams, transition state, anything at all? All right. Now, the reactions we were just looking at were a simple one step reaction, right? One transition state. However, it is possible to have multiple steps. That is, you have two transition states. And when you have two transition states, you're going to have what's called an intermediate. So that's what's being shown on this reaction coordinate diagram. Um, so an intermediate is not your product, but it's stable. It has to be somewhat stable to be an intermediate. To be an intermediate, you have to be measurable. You have to exist for a certain period of time. And if you have two transition states, you have two different delta G double daggers. And whatever delta G double dagger is the biggest is your rate limiting step. So actually, let me get the red pen out since I have different colors here. So the graph on the left is just showing you the same reaction, but two different mechanisms. The red line is saying, OK, if, if the reaction happened this way, our second step is the rate determining step. Because delta G double dagger for our second step oops, is much bigger than our first step. While the blue line is saying, the blue line is saying our first step is our rate limiting step because delta G double dagger is bigger here than it is here. All right, so that's what the left, left graph is saying. Now, what the right image is showing is what happens when you have a catalyst. And what a catalyst does is that it changes delta G double dagger. And the, the difference between the uncatalyzed reaction and the catalyzed reaction, you're gonna love this. It's called delta, delta G double dagger. All right, so remember delta equals is, is basically difference. Anytime you see delta, you should think difference or change. So delta, delta means change in delta G double dagger. So it's, what is the change of delta G double dagger? And all a catalyst does is that it lowers our transition state. If you note, the energy of the reactants and the energy of the products never change. So a catalyst does not change equilibrium. It won't change the equilibrium condition. It just speeds up how fast you get to equilibrium. And the, the amount that you speed up your reaction by is given by this term. The exponent of delta delta G double dagger divided by RT is how fast you speed up your reaction. Right? So for example, if, if you lower if delta delta G is negative 10, and by the way, delta delta G should always be negative. 
least I believe so. If you do that, you just do exponent minus 10 divided by RT to get your, your speed, All right? So any questions about what's presented on this slide about transition state, about what a catalyst is doing, anything like that? All right. So here I have a poll, get you engaged. I've been doing a lot of talking today. So I wanna know, based on what we talked about so far, which of these best describes an enzyme? And we'll do about 30 more seconds. So please, please get your vote in if you haven't yet. All right, and so it looks like the majority of us have it. It is B, speeds up our uh, chemical reaction, uh, or it speeds up how fast we get to equilibrium. Um, catalyst doesn't necessarily make something go extremely fast. It just makes it go faster compared to the uncatalyst rate. Does not change thermodynamics. Thermodynamics is delta G of a reaction. And we just looked at, on this right-hand plot, delta G never changes, catalyzed versus uncatalyzed. You only change the transition state. All right, question four here. Be besides amino acids, what do you need sometimes for an enzyme to be active? What, what are those things called again that we talked about? Substrate? Yeah, uh, I guess substrate is technically true, um, but I was thinking more like cofactors. 
All right, cofactors are the are, are the teeth that make the reaction happen. True, if you don't have a substrate, the reaction won't happen. Um, but yeah, cofactors. Okay, question five. Here's some hands-on practice for you to understand the transition state diagrams we were talking about. So I want everybody to take a few minutes here and label the transition states, label the intermediates, and determine if this reaction as shown is spontaneous or not. Is it thermodynamically favorable? So take a couple minutes, see if you understand those transition state diagrams, those reaction plots we were talking about. If you don't, if you get confused, please let me know. Um, I'm gonna put up a question timer that I haven't used in a long time, but it's just a progress report of, if you're finished with this and confident, finished but not sure, you got part of the way and not sure and no idea how to begin. Um, but yeah, um, see if you can do this. And once you got to either finished or not quite finished, I'll put in the poll. Um, but yeah, give you a couple minutes to do that. If you have questions, let me know. Do about 30 more seconds for this one. All right, seems like the majority of us are finished, but we aren't confident in ourselves. Be confident. All right, I know that's an easy thing to say, but a hard thing to get. All right, so let's let's take a look. First off, what's the difference between a transition state and an intermediate? Uh, an intermediate is stable 
and can be measured. A transition state is not stable and you really can't measure it. Transition states are the humps. Intermediates would be the valleys. And delta G here is positive. So this is unfavorable, not spontaneous. And the way you look at that is you just look at your reactants versus your products. If your products are higher than your reactants, that's delta G being positive. If your products are lower than your reactants, so the line I just drew there, sure, let's use purple. That's delta G is negative. So that is spontaneous. All right. So any questions about what this is uh, asking you or anything at all? Now let's do a little bit of math, everyone's favorite. And I'm gonna do question six, we can do that together. And then I'll let you try and do question C. So here we have, how much does streptococcal nuclease decrease the activation energy, activation free energy, delta G double dagger of its reaction, which is breaking a phosphodiester bond at 25C? if R is given here. Yeah, so we have to find strath nuclease on this graph. Here it is. And we are trying to figure out what is uh, delta delta G double deck. Because, and that might not be obvious, but we're saying we want to know what the decrease, how much does it, how much does it decrease the activation free energy delta G double dagger? So we're asking for what is the change in delta G double dagger? So we're asking for delta delta G double dagger. So we want to use this equation here. The rate enhancement is equal to this. So for staff, our rate enhancement is 5.6 times 10 to the 14. So 5.6 times 10 to the 14 is equal to exponent delta, delta G double dagger divided by RT. Right. So here's a little math lesson for everybody. If you have a variable and you're taking the exponent of that variable, you are not allowed to touch that variable until you get rid of the exponent. So I have to get rid of this E or EXP if I want to solve delta delta G double dagger. The way to get rid of an exponent in math is to take the natural log of each side. So natural log LN cancels out exponent. And if you're looking at your calculator, if you find the exponent button, you'll see the natural log button is like right above that as the second function because they are opposite processes. So if I take the natural log of each side, the exponent cancels out. So let me pop up Excel here. The natural log of 5.6 times 10 to the 14. Uh, 14. So this is equal to 33.96 equals delta delta G double dagger divided by RT. Multiply each side by RT to get our variable alone. 33.96 times RT equals delta delta G 
doubled egg. So let's put our R in there, 8.314. T should be in Kelvin, because our R is in Kelvin. So that should be 25 plus 273. Eight. So this is 84,138 joules per mole or 84 kilojoules. So what this, what this says is that this enzyme is lowering our transition state by 84 kilojoules, which is basically two and a half ATP. So it's lowering our transition state by a lot, which is why our rate enhancement is huge, 5.6 times 10 to the 14th. So it's speeding up our reaction by incredible amount because we are lowering that transition state by an incredible amount. Any questions about how I did the math there or any confusions? Did I lose, lose you at certain steps I did. I think the hardest part of this question is actually understanding that you're looking for delta delta G double dagger. Once you have that, that's just algebra. But yeah, the harder thing is realizing that the decrease of delta G double dagger is delta delta G double dagger. You're looking for the change in delta G double dagger. Any questions about that math? So I'm going to let you do this question then. So assume that you make a hydrogen bond, that a hydrogen bond lowers free energy by minus 40 kilojoules per mole. I want to know how much faster a reaction will go. What is the rate enhancement of reaction if you form one hydrogen bond? So see if you can calculate that using the information here. Very similar to what we just did. I'll give you a few minutes to do that. Then I'll come back with the explanation and we'll call it a week. Let's see if you can uh, get this one. If you have questions, please do let me know.
All right, time is running short here. So um, let's go over this. Hopefully you're able to make some progress. So we're making one hydrogen bond. That is 40 kilojoules per mole. So delta delta G double dagger is 40 kilojoules per mole. Um, so I think I said earlier when I uh, first mentioned delta delta G double dagger, it should be negative. That was my mistake. Uh, it, it should be positive. If you put in negative 40, you're going to get a really small number. So delta delta G double dagger is 40 kilojoules per mole. That's how much we're lowering the barrier by. R is 8.314 joules per mole. Temperature should be in Kelvin to 98. So before we do any math, we have to look at our units. The gas constants in joules. Uh, delta delta G is in kilojoules. So I have to do some conversions. I'm going to convert delta delta G double dagger to joules. So it's 40,000 joules per mole. If you want to keep delta delta G double dagger as kilojoules and convert R to kilojoules, that's fine too. I'm just going to do it this way. And now we're pretty much done. We just have to plug this into our calculator. So it's the exponent of 40,000 divided by 8.314 times 298. And so our rate enhancement is when we do this, 1027, 1037. So our rate by making one hydrogen bond, if a hydrogen bond has a free energy of minus 40 kilojoules per mole, is 10 million. We have just sped up our, our reaction by 10 million times by making one hydrogen bond. Right. Any questions about that math or that idea? All right. So I'm going to put some homework up, give you some practice with this math and concept of enzymes. Uh, remember, test on Monday. Um, study hard. Let me know if you have questions. Um, if you want to have a meeting, feel free to email me, uh, pop on by um, to office hours. If I'm not in my office hours, shoot me an email. Um, and then I can hop on sometimes. Um, I'm just busy doing one thing. I in the time I just forget to look at the time. Uh, so feel free to email me if that ever happens. Otherwise, study hard. Hope you have a good weekend. Let me know if you have any questions whatsoever. And I will see you. People on Monday. Have a good one, everybody.